floated up his family and animals, and then they floated off to safety. Is that pretty much what he said? Pretty much it. I think you might have preached about the storms of life that are still coming and those waves that kind of get over our bows once in a while. Now, but this week, the ark has landed and the waters have receded. And I'm pretty sure that they were ready to open those doors of that ark, maybe let in a little fresh air because things might have got a little stale in there over those uh, several months. That's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. And soon the animals were on their way. They were slithering, flying, walking, bounding, and gently abandoning ship. As Noah and his family looked out that door, and they saw a bright new world with bright new promises. That's what they were seeing. New start and a new place. And you know what? The old ark, it didn't come to rest in the place it started from, right? And folks, I pray that we don't either. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah, and welcome to the seasons where we get together and we celebrate new birth and new life. If you're a guest here today, we're so glad that you're here with us. We hope that you have a wonderful worship service with us. And if there's ever anything that we can do to help you out, answer a question or just give you a word of encouragement, all you got to do is give us a call. We're happy to do that. And as I tell Rod, we have the best job in the world. Prayer cards are in your folders over there, and here's some right here. If there's a joy or concern you'd like for us to lift up this morning, fill it out, bring it up here, or you can put it right here. Oh, uh, I, uh, shared with you the time my brother-in-law and I were out fishing, and uh, we had our boat anchored up along this little spoil island in Ingleside Cove, and one thing led to another, and we looked up, and our boat was floating off across the cove, the anchor pulled loose. <laughs> I'm good at many things. Walking on water is not one of them. So like a dummy, I dove in the water. I tore off after that boat floating across the cove. And I realized quickly I wasn't going to catch up to it. The tide was moving it faster than I could swim. So I had enough sense to stop, turn around, and, you know, it seemed like I'd only been swimming 100 yards. And that island looked like it was half a mile away. So I made my way back. I managed to float, swim, and pray my way back to that little island. And so when I got there, I found myself in a safe place. I had my feet on solid ground. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. It was great to feel solid ground underneath our feet. We were safe. The waters surrounded us. But we were safe. We were on dry land. <laughs> the only problem was we couldn't stay there. I want to read to us from God's Word this morning. From the book of Genesis, you know the story well of Noah and the flood. This is from the 8th chapter. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 and then 15 through 19, we hear these words, God remembered Noah, all those alive, and all the animals with him in the ark. God sent a wind over the earth so that the waters receded. The springs of the deep sea and the skies closed up. The skies held back the rain. The waters receded gradually from the earth after 100 years. 50 days the waters decreased and in the seventh month on the 17th day the ark came to rest on the Arad mountains the waters decreased gradually until the 10th month and on the first day of the 10th month the mountain peaks appeared God spoke to Noah go out of the ark you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you all the animals of every kind, birds, livestock, everything crawling on the ground, so that they may populate the earth, be fertile, and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out of the ark with his sons, his wife, 
and his sons' wives. All the animals, all the livestock, all the birds and everything crawling on the ground came out of the ark by their families. Grass withers and dies away from the hot sun. Flowers bloom and then they die. But the word of our God endures forever. This is the word of God for the people of God and for that we say, Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. Good and gracious God, this day, may your word be fresh on our ears, fresh in our hearts. May we see and hear with new eyes and new ears. It's always in Jesus' name. Amen. So there we were. We were safe and sound, surrounded, stranded on a spoil island in Ingleside Cove, and it was great to feel solid ground underneath my feet. We were safe. The water surrounded us, but we had our feet on dry land and we had our heads above water. You might know, the guy would have a big nose. But the realization dawned, we can't stay here forever. And that realization pushed us to find a way off that little island. There was no fresh water there. And the way the fishing was going that morning, we would have starved to death inside two days. The rainbow at the end of this little storm in my life came in the form of another fisherman passing by who we waved down, who went across the cove, retrieved our boat, and brought it back to us. Fishermen do that for one another. Yes. Do you realize how long Noah and those elephants and those giraffes and gorillas and monkeys and baboons and rattlesnakes and crocodiles. Do you realize how long they were on that boat? A long time. Scripture tells us it rained for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. That water covered everything. And that in time the waters did recede, but a year had passed. A year had passed before those that were safely tucked away in that ark could emerge and walk on dry land. One full year. I remember the days working offshore with my dad on those shrimp boats. After two or three weeks, two or three weeks offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, I'd get cabin fever so bad that walking on water sounded like a pretty good idea. I just wanted to get away from those limited quarters that we had. Couldn't go anywhere. Couldn't do anything. You were cramped in. So I have a, I have a hard time imagining being cooped up for a full year of those cramped, smelly, leaky, damp conditions. Those conditions that they had to endure. But the days passed, and finally the waters receded. The flood subsided. That's the thing about floods. They pass. That's the thing about floods. The waters do eventually recede. Once they've passed, things may be different. A part of our life may be gone forever. A part that we didn't really want to be gone, but it may be gone. Once those waters have receded, things may never be quite once they were before. But the reality is, a new day has dawned. From time to time, we have different pastors preaching here. Next week, Pastor Bill, who's been leading us this morning, is going to preach about a couple of boys. A couple of brothers that didn't get along too well. Harry and Grabby. He'll talk about them next week. This morning, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Ron. I'm glad to bring the word, but I wonder what would it be like if Noah could make an appearance this morning. And no, I'm not going to transform into Noah, transform into Noah. But if Noah could show up and just talk to us and share with us just a few snappets of wisdom, just a few tidbits, what would Noah have to say? I was reading an article by a an author named Ross Cochran not long ago, and I was impressed by some of the things and thoughts that he had. 
And I realize that Scripture doesn't really give us a whole lot of dialogue here. But Scripture does give us enough that we might make a, at least a decent guess at what Noah might say. Noah might say something like this. Remember, remember that where you go from here, where you go from this moment, where you take off from this new starting point, will be determined, where you go, will be determined by your faith. And your faith is going to be tested by what has remained once the storm has left. Where you go will be determined by your faith. And your faith will be tested by what remains. Noah might also say, let God close the door on your past. Amen. Thank you. In chapter 7, who closes the door to the ark? Do you remember? God. God says, go into that ark. And God closes the door. One year later, God says, okay guys, it's time. Leave the ark. Go. Who opens the door? Noah. God closes the door on the past and we take responsibility for moving forward. Noah might say, wait. Wait for God. Wait on God's timing. Sometimes God's schedule is not our schedule. Doesn't that just drive you crazy sometimes? <laughs> Don't you just want to get up in the morning and go, God, I haven't worked out for you this morning. <laughs> I've got this sign taped to my desk right in front of my telephone. It says, today, I will remember that there is only one Messiah. Sometimes God's schedule isn't our schedule. Sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes we have to wait. That morning on that little spoil island, my brother-in-law and I learned what it is to simply wait. Sometimes you can't really do a whole lot about your situation. You've got to wait for some help. We were looking for a way off. Noah might say, make good use of your time. What do you think Noah was doing that year he spent in that ark? Playing video games? I don't think so. He had a lot of time to think make plans about what he and his family would be doing once the storm was over. And Noah would say, don't stay in the ark. Don't stay in the ark. As I said, in chapter 7, Noah told God told Noah and his family, go. Go into the ark. You'll need it for shelter and safety. But in chapter 8, the flood has receded and God tells Noah and the family to leave. You and your wife, your sons, your wives, your sons' wives, all of the animals on board, open that door and get out of here. The future is not here in the ark. Where is the future? It's out there. The mission field isn't in here. It's beyond these walls. There's work to be done. There's a world to build. And you can't do it sitting inside a boat stranded on dry land. I think so often that's what happens to us. We just sit around the ark. We drink coffee, we have planning sessions, we make sure the ark is in good repair, we play it safe. I think we're guilty of that kind of behavior sometimes as individuals, I think we're guilty of that kind of behavior sometimes as a community of faith, as a church. But that's not what God has in mind. Indeed, there are times when we need the safety and the shelter of the ark of an ark-like environment. Not necessarily a physical ark, but a spiritual ark. To always sustain us. But when those floods recede, it's time to emerge into a new world. A world that needs our gifts and our graces. A world that needs our help with the rebuilding process. I remember a morning long ago, 
was in the middle 60s, I was with my dad and my brother offshore, and we had just dropped anchor on one of those big shrimp boats in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. The night's work was over with. We were beginning to clean the nets and the deck, and we had a lot of those little spring storms scattered around the area. The weather was not bad, but out there, sometimes one of those little squalls, the storm can just pop down on you in an instant. They don't last long, but they're here and they're gone. And all of a sudden, the wind began to pick up, and the sky got dark, and just in a heartbeat, we had a little squall on top of us. I don't know whose fault it was, but I know this, the hatch cover on the front of the boat was not secured. And a gust of wind picked that large hatch cover up and blew it over the side. My dad, the captain, screamed. No, he, yeah, he screamed. <laughs> Ryan! That's what he called me. Get over the side and get that hatch cover. You see, without that hatch cover, the rains and all would come inside. The, you don't want water inside a boat at sea. You want the water out there. And so I ran to the side of the boat. And along the side of the, our, our boats were these giant tires that were like, you know, for bumpers up against the docks at, uh, when we got back to port. And they were tied and secured with these big heavy ropes. And that hatch cover was coming along the side. I rolled, rolled over the side, grabbed hold of the uh, rope, and I was standing on that tire. And I managed to get hold of the hatch cover, swung it up to my brother. And I could feel the boat already beginning its motion. It had rolled far to the, to the right side, the starboard side, high in the air. I looked down, I must have been 8, 10, 12 feet from the, from the water. And I knew I didn't have enough time to scramble back aboard. And so all I could do was plant both feet on that tire, hold onto that rope with everything that I had, and wait for the inevitable. I now personally know what it feels like to be a Lipton tea bag. <laughs> when that boat rolled back to the other side, it dumped me. Uh, I got a good baptism of salt water, and it came back up, and I scrambled aboard. That day, I responded quickly for no other reason than the captain gave an order. I just responded. Noah did the same thing. Noah did not complain. Noah responded to what God wanted done. Noah followed God's orders. Get inside, batten down the hatches. And now, Noah, it's over. Take the hatch cover off. Open the door and leave. 1956 was a watershed moment in the life of the United Methodist Church. A door was opened that year that has had incredible effects, wonderful positive effects on the life of the United Methodist Church. In 1956, the church opened the door for the full ordination of female clergy. Up to that point, women were allowed to work in the church in various capacities and this, that, and the other, but they were not allowed to serve or just were not ordained as, as full clergy. And so gradually, over time, women began to take a more prominent place in the life of the church as, as clergy, as ordained clergy. It took some time before district superintendents and bishops really embraced that. Up to that point, it had been a male-only group. Doors are opened. Doors of opportunity are opened in many ways, in many places. And sometimes doors remain shut and closed for those that are moving forward. In 2014, two ships are being decommissioned, taken out of service, put to dry dock, if you will. One of those is named the Southwest Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. That's the conference in which we hold membership. And also, being decommissioned this year will be the Rio Grande Conference of the United Methodist Church. La Trinidad, our brothers and sisters right down the street, uh, are members of the Rio Grande Conference. And the reason is, is because the two conferences are unifying, coming together as one. Something new is being created, and a new door is being opened. 
A door is being closed to the past for the conferences. A door is being closed for, on many fronts. We have so much work to do. There are so many differences in the way we work in our two different conferences, but we have one Lord and one mission, and so we are doing that. Things will be different, and things will be exciting. But sometimes we close doors on the past, and we open doors to the future for new opportunities. When Noah walked down that gangplank, the world that he knew was gone. The world that he had known, that he had grown up in, was forever gone. And I think most of us know that feeling in one way or another. We know how Noah must have felt because we have experienced those life-altering events, those life-altering times when the world that we knew is gone. A new community that bears little resemblance to the one that we grew up in. A community that bears little resemblance to the one that our ancestors knew is gone. And we find ourselves with new neighbors. The dynamics of neighborhoods change. Industry relocates. Sometimes it moves away, and sometimes it moves into our neighborhoods. New highways are built, new highways or old highways are closed down. That's when the church needs to adopt the spirit of Noah to move out and begin again. Go. Leave. Leave this place. Go and face whatever is out there. Okay. So things are different. In fact, everything may be different. You may not recognize anything at all. But it's a new beginning. But remember this. God, Noah would say, has carried you through the rough times. And here's the good news. We forget sometimes. God has been there with you in the good times. The rough and the good. And what God has done yesterday, God is doing today. When the floods came, God sheltered you. God closed the door of His protection around you, and God shielded you. But now it's time to move on. You cannot stay in the ark forever, or else will become a comfort zone. It was never intended to be a permanent dwelling place. It's just a temporary safe haven. So we ask, Lord, where do we go from here? What do we do next? I'm not sure I have a clear answer for that for 2014. But I do know this. The answer is not to just hunker down and stay on the ark. The answer is to move out there. Amen.